Good afternoon. Um, we're going to start the afternoon panel. Uh, the um, original moderator was going to be Wendy Jacob from Harvard Law School, but she had a family emergency. Um, and so we are pleased instead to have her colleague, Aladdin Joroff, who is an attorney and lecturer at the Harvard Law School Environmental Law Clinic. And so I will now turn it over to you to run the program. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I just want to take a quick moment to introduce this panel and put it into the context of today's conversation. So harking back to Michael's comments at the beginning of the day, the concept of keeping the lights on encompasses both resiliency and sustainability measures, often in a very synergetic fashion. So energy resiliency can be thought of as, you know, very basically keeping buildings functioning in events of power outages or stresses. And one step to achieving this goal is designing, constructing, and retrofitting buildings to reduce energy use and support energy efficiency so that buildings can operate in a world with rising temperatures without increasing their energy loads. Um, as we'll hear, these mechanisms blur the lines between climate change mitigation and adaptation. But other steps involve integrating energy systems directly into buildings and building sites, taking advantage of new technologies, such as distributed generation, and re-envisioning the relationship between buildings and utilities more broadly. So as we heard in the second panel today, professionals, including architects and engineers and developers, may be expected to advise their clients on these resiliency strategies, particularly as more information about them becomes available, including in the form of guidance. Um, so in this panel, we're going to have leaders in the building sector discuss best thinking and best practices around energy resiliency. So I'll just introduce the panelists very briefly. Um, there are longer bios in the program material. But we're going to start with Brian Murray, who's an operations manager and construction executive with Brassfield and Gorey. Uh, and close to 30 years working in the construction industry, uh, Brian, uh, Brian has delivered many high-performance green buildings through innovative design and construction strategies uh, founded on best practices and lessons learned, both for new and retrofitting buildings. Then Jim Garrison will join Brian in talking about energy resiliency measures in the early stages of building design and construction, from selection of building materials, systems, equipment, and designs. Uh, Jim is the founder of Garrison Architects, which since its inception in 1991 has become a leader in modular building and sustainability architecture. And his work includes um, some novel development of post-disaster housing. I'm not sure we'll get to speak about that today, but it's worth looking into. Um, third in our panel is Scott Frank, who's a partner at Jaros, Baum & Bowles, a first full-service consulting firm of which he leads the sustainable design practice. Scott's also a founding member of the Urban Green Council and serves on New York City's Energy Code Advisory Committee. Scott has managed energy efficiency projects at local sites, including the office towers at the World Trade Center site and Columbia's own Jerome Green Science Center. And Scott's going to focus about on um, incorporating energy generation, such as fuel cells and microgrids, directly into buildings and their sites. And that's going to lead into Travis Bradford, who's going to wrap up the presentation section of the panel with a discussion of, kind of external tools for increasing building resiliency such as strategies and business cases for integrating distributed elements of energy into building operations. Uh, Travis is a professor, professor sorry, a professional practice at Columbia, where he teaches energy and natural resource markets and innovations. He's also the founder and president of the Prometheus Institute for Sustainable Development. So we're going to have the panelists present and then have an opportunity for questions at the end. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me OK? Great. Really appreciate being invited today and being a part of the panel. Sorry. I'm with Brasfield and Glory. Um, we're based in Birmingham, Alabama. You should see what it's like coming through LaGuardia and JFK with an Alabama driver's license. I think there's a couple of folks in here that have done that. Um, we know we're not number one like y'all, but <laughs> thanks for letting us come into the state. So. <clears throat> We're also, you, you heard earlier today from Beth Heider, um, Beth's with Skanska, they're doing I think about seven billion a year in the US. We're about half the size of Skanska in the US. Our major footprints where you see the yellow on the map above, and why I wanted to highlight that to you is that we're working in some of the areas that you've heard in the earlier discussions that are being most affected by the climate, by potential future climate changes, 
um, and really weathering the storm and keeping the power on. <clears throat> so just to talk a little bit about keeping the power on, I wanted to hopefully share with you some insights from a contractor's point of view. I know there's some construction lawyers obviously in the room. Um, having worked with GSA on many jobs, Kevin and his peers uh, and other DOD entities, those two government agencies focus a lot on resiliency and they always have. Um, I don't know that it's really as much of what sometimes people try to make a political issue as much as it is just smart. It's smart to build with resilience and sustainability in mind and probably also including adaptation in there, which I heard just a minute ago. <clears throat> GSA, the, on the facilities we work on, are usually planning for buildings to last 100 years. I would argue, Kevin, y'all are building and planning for buildings to last two to 300 years, the way that you maintain them and in the way that adaptability is built into them. But all the buildings, whether they're built for GSA or private sector, are going to be affected by challenges that, that will ultimately affect whether or not the lights can be kept on. So general weather, the weather seems to be getting a little bit worse every year. Whether that's being caused by humans or not, I don't know. But I do know what I see. I see that we're dealing with more responses every year than we have since I've been doing this in the last three years. And it requires some planning up front to be able to deal with that. Um, so really adapting the way we think early on in the planning process. Funding. I heard insurance talked about earlier, and I want to talk about that a little bit later on. All those things that actually happen in the operations side of the building really have to have a lot more thought on the front end of the building. <clears throat> General weather uh, extremes can often lead to floods, tidal surges, and some of the technologies that we're seeing that are migrating into um, non-coastal environments are things that we used to only see in condos, like breakaway walls and breakaway slabs, um, the types of equipment that are being put on the units to help them survive in more inclement uh, conditions. So here's an example. The yellow device you see in the entrance to this parking garage, that's an automatic uh, flood barrier. When it senses a certain level of water, the barrier pops up, prevents water from entering into the below um, surface parking area. The plan you see on the bottom is, and I know it's hard to read, it's highlighting automatic flood barrier. That's a, a screenshot from a U.S. courthouse that's currently being constructed in Mobile, Alabama, where they're deploying uh, these automatic flood barriers. Mobile, believe it or not, receives more rain than any other city in the United States, even Seattle. And um, I didn't know that until I unsuccessfully pursued that job. Um, but I learned a lot about the flood plain uh, and GSA's uh, intent to not, it used to be just four or five years ago, GSA's projects would focus on the 100-year floodplain. Today, 500-year floodplain is a given. And uh, I heard reference earlier today to the 1,000-year um, weather event. And I, I, I don't think we can ignore that. It's real. It's happening. Wind, there seem to be a lot more direct line winds and direct line wind shear than we've seen in the past they're just popping up with with normal storms but then you add on top of it the hurricane force storms we're seeing a lot of complementary uh, design thought being put in between federal projects that have blast resistant capabilities in their skin and hurricane um, type facades in south florida and now we're about to see Texas go through the same type of building code change that Florida went through in 0405 because of the hurricanes that they've recently dealt with. But it's also changed the way we operate as a contractor. So when Hurricane Irma was on its way up and no one really knew whether it was going up the left side, the right side, or up the tailpipe, we did something as an organization as part of our resiliency plan to not only support ourselves and our employees but to help our clients we deployed over 300 satellite phones to all of our leaders um, that operate in the state of Florida. And we had uh, check provisions on once this storm comes in, regardless of where it comes in, we had a network of who is to contact who. 
And then second, after we made sure each other were okay, kind of like when you're on the Delta plane, they're like, you know, take your own oxygen mask first before you help others. Then uh, we reach out to our clients. And this is all supposed to happen in a, in a 30 minute, an hour uh, time frame. And that occurred. And uh, even our clients in South Florida weren't as impacted as what they could have been had that Cat 5 hit directly. But that level of preparedness, I see reaching its way into requirements from insurance companies and reinsurance companies. I don't see how it can't. So where I'm going with that is I believe in the future we're going to see some insurance companies requiring for owners and property um, managers to keep insurance intact that uh, has provisions for resiliency and recovery in, in events. So I mentioned something earlier about the breakaway walls and slabs for construction attorneys in the room. I don't know if you've ever had to dealt with, deal with this before, but I'm a magnet for this kind of stuff. Um, there was a project, I won't name what it was, but a, a blow away wall in a severe tidal event caused property damage uh, to another adjacent property. And you know, one thing leads to another and all of a sudden there's a lawsuit. But it's something I hadn't thought about until that happened on how do you deal with that? How do you, more importantly, prevent it? So now we're putting more thought into how in these, in these elements of the buildings that are meant to protect ultimately the infrastructure and the buildings, how do we also protect other buildings from those devices when they happen? Some of the other trends we're seeing out on the West Coast, anyone here from California? All right. Um, you got jet lag? So <clears throat> this, building frame this structural steel and concrete uh, frame you see behind or behind me is a, a typical frame you'll see on a project being built in california right now with x bracing to help deal with seismic and lateral loads from seismic uh, conditions we're seeing this technology brought into other areas of the country also to deal with some of these unusual events whether it be tidal high wind i mean at some point we're going to deal with a cat six hurricane right it's coming because five is going to have too big of a window on it they're gonna have to create a new category it's coming that's when we're going to see these types of design elements migrate their way into uh, more areas of the country something else i like to share in some of our more uh, sensitive projects we work on for various confidential agencies <laughs> um we used to see rf protection um been installed in the perimeters and we took a lot of the technology out of the, the hospitals we build and protecting MRI machines and other sensitive equipment and, and have deployed that in these um, buildings that require RF protection but we're also now seeing this technology and, and construction being placed into buildings that are fearful of being harmed by electromagnetic pulses whether it comes from the Sun or whether it comes from North Korea um, that's an expanding practice that we're seeing and i don't know if you are but it's um I, I envision that'll be on the rise and it'll be a key element to keeping the power on especially because it, it directly affects the the power grid and the ability for power to stay online i mentioned earlier uh, gsa's projects if you if you're working on a, a new building for gsa that's over three stories they'll not only have blast resistance features to them to protect against terrorism threats, but also a progressive collapse uh, characteristics and, and complements to that. And that's really as a result of the um, 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. But the technologies that have been developed in those buildings really for the last 12 to 15 years are really phenomenal. It's gotten to be a, a very um, fun scope of work to be involved in because the physics and, and design elements are so unique. But I could also see these techniques being brought into the private sector for projects that are at risk, whether they're directly on the coast um, or in other areas that could suffer from other types of impending threats. We're also designing and building now projects that are focused a lot more on potential terror, um, a specific federal police agency that I've worked with over the last few years recently told me our biggest threat now is from within, which is a little bit disturbing, but the technologies and practices that we've been spent working on for the last 12 to 15 years are migrating now into how to deal with that inside of facilities. 
technology, the more that our buildings become smart, the more that is a risk to the grid and keeping the power on. You know, if we can fly drones in Afghanistan, someone in Afghanistan can shut down power in the room we're in if it's a smart building. <clears throat> Something else that I think most of us take for granted, perhaps the most single influential um, infrastructure item, sorry that I'm just learning how to drive PowerPoint, um, is our railroad infrastructure. Without the railroad infrastructure in this country, uh, we would not have the robust economy and ability to um, produce the goods and services that we do today. But a lot of our rail lines are located on the coastal areas that, that we saw earlier today in the reporting that are now in danger of flooding, coastal flooding and high winds. You can't drive a train down a railroad line that's gonna be subject to unusually high winds. Sorry that the slide kept progressing. Something else I wanted to report to you that I think is very important to um, keeping the, the, the grid up and, and keeping energy and power up is our reuse of brownfield sites. This is going to happen more and more. Obviously, we're, we're in the mecca for brownfield sites, right? But there's other cities now that are following you, New York's trends and, and um, prowess, really, in, in reusing its sites. Atlanta being one of them. This is an old GM assembly plant located near Doraville, just north of Atlanta. That plant was recently completely demolished, and 95% of the original plant was recycled. It's pretty fantastic. Most of the materials were trained to Birmingham, to old steel yards that are located in Birmingham, Alabama, and are being repurposed in, into uh, new use. But as part of the new development, Planning for smart grid, segregated smart grid, backup power, sustainability, on-site gray water collection, and hopefully at some point actually collecting water from the 10 million square feet worth of space that's on this property into feeding the air handler units and other mechanical units on the site will make this property virtually net zero. It's pretty exciting to see this large of a facility having that type of forethought. Again, I feel like they're following New York's example. But I also want to share with you what I think the single largest challenge to keeping the lights on and resiliency, and that's skilled labor. And I don't just mean hammer swinging, mechanics putting insulation and, and you know equipment in. I'm also talking about the folks that are managing mm -hmm. and delivering the work. All of the folks that are involved in delivering construction projects or who are innately sought after when there's a recovery situation, when there's a resiliency issue, when a hurricane hits and cleanup is needed. When that happens, there's a domino effect into the other ongoing work, and that's happening now nationwide. This is also a greater challenge because we don't see as many folks in the younger generations coming into construction. So somehow, and, and some of the organizations out there, including BESS and, and ours, we're, we're focused on attracting the new generations into construction, making it fun, sharing some of this sustainability and resiliency thoughts with them, getting them excited about being part of a bigger picture than just simply delivering a project today. It's more about delivering a living building for tomorrow. <clears throat> so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over. We're doing questions later. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. As we set up the next slides, I just want to thank Brian for really wrapping into the range of you know climate change impacts and how they're all relevant to this idea of keeping a building operating um, from the grid perspective. And it's inspiring to hear the range of opportunities that are out there, a little scary, <laughs> the range of risks. Um, but thank you for that. Is it this one down here? No, I don't know. Okay, I'm going to keep going. 
Well, good after afternoon, everyone. I have to say that uh, uh, Brian and his uh, his crew at Brasfield and Gorey, if you ever get a chance to go to um, Birmingham and see the work that they do and the work they do around the country, it's it's uh, it's remarkable uh, uh, how high a quality of construction there is, uh, in sometimes outside of our places like New York. Um, I uh, am, ob ob as an architect, not an expert in the delivery of energy systems. Matter of fact, I, what I have to do is most of the time is pull back uh, quite far into the uh, you know the generalities and try to integrate uh, best technologies and try to look to the future in as progressive and uh, advantageous a way as I can. And uh, I, I also teach at the Pratt Institute, and uh, of course that's, that's something that's very important to in, in the midst of uh, teaching students for dealing with the future. Um, resilience is a funny, I mean, you just saw in Brian's uh, presentation that there are tentacles that cover so many aspects of contemporary uh, building culture and life that it's almost impossible to contain it. It's a really, really funny thing. Sustainability's always been that way, and resilience just adds another factor to how fast we can come back or how we can avoid uh, disruption. They're absolutely interrelated, and as an architect, uh, both things are now on the table and constantly in play. So uh, I'm going to go through a few projects, and I'm going to wrap up with a project that our students have been working on having to do with carbon sequestration. So let's see, go forward, we go, okay. The first, uh, so after Katrina, <laughs> we had a very big lesson here in New York with uh, Sandy uh, uh, basically destroying much of the uh, waterfront in New York City. Um, this is, these are the beaches and rockways after Sandy. You can kind of see that uh, there's nothing left. And uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg asked us to come up with a way to restore the beaches in the five months between Christmas and Memorial Day, immediately after the uh, uh, after Sandy. Now, in this this comes to an issue with resilience that has something to do with technique and planning and how government and private sector get together to decide how to solve the problem. And here we had no standards. We had no idea really what we should do. We knew there was something like, uh, I suppose we discovered that there was a 500 year flood level. We discovered that Sandy had actually reached that level. We had to decide as a group in a, in a big room with all of government and uh, many uh, uh, private uh, uh, businesses how to respond and what we did is we we called upon the resources of the region to rebuild that is we used uh, modular architecture prefabrication techniques a variety of digital means and we deployed resources from outside of the immediately impacted area which is a resilience strategy tends to help a lot um, and we made a new set of buildings for the beaches and new uh, ways to restore dunes and boardwalks that would allow the buildings to basically be net zero buildings, operate with absolutely minimal energy means, and to come back onto line because we assume that it's very difficult to predict the consequences of any given storm. I'm talking about uh, Cat 6 storms, God only knows what that means. So the, we do our, our best with these things, but from the get-go, every building gets treated to minimize its energy consumption, make it able to uh, function without supplemental energy. Uh, so you see these buildings lifted above the beach. Here they are being fabricated uh, in, uh, in central Pennsylvania on an assembly line that was repurposed after World War II. Uh, lifted on barges and floated in place uh, and finally brought 
onto the beach. So that was a big lesson for us because we understood that the, one of the great challenges in a resiliency effort is to move quickly after an event and restore life and uh, uh, um, everyone's economic prospects as, as quickly as we possibly can. It led to the next uh, initiative on the part of New York City, which was post-disaster interim housing. So the idea that if you're displaced from your home, we can get you into something other than the Marriott within about six months. So this was uh, followed on the heels of the, of the uh, beach restoration and used similar technology, but now a, a set of uh, skills that had been learned about how to uh, make such things work. And uh, we uh, prototyped this and put this in place for, the, for New York City. And we're losing, we have now leveraged this this body of knowledge in a variety of ways, which I'll show you in a, in a second. This, uh, these houses are built in one day, the one, one in one day, of course many could be built, and they are, can be used and, resour and sourced from a region, again, to restore uh, uh, any area that's affected. And they also, uh, of course, have all the energy, uh, energy conservation advantages that we could possibly muster. The other side of Sandy that was not so easy was to rebuild the uh, communities of the, the smaller scale communities around the city. And uh, the city faltered in this. They, uh, they tried to build uh, by using conventional methods and uh, by drawing on uh, union forces at an 80 percent uh, wage rate. You imagine that uh, the guys didn't uh, stay on the job very long uh, under those circumstances and they had never built stick framed houses. In New York City. So we started to use some of the same um, methods. In this case, uh, with my uh, partner, uh, Deborah Gans and Gans Studio. Uh, and we, uh, this is just finishing up now. And all of these communities, let's see if this will keep going, have, have been raised, prefabricated houses have been installed, and we have doubled the. Well, we've cut the delivery time in half, and we've uh, cut the costs by about 30 or 40 percent. And we've gotten the city back online with this whole effort. So this is a very useful technique. And the other the, uh, challenge, of course, now is what do we do about places where the affordability con context is much, much different than it is in New York? And what do we do about uh, uh, Category 6, Category 5? Uh, hurricanes. So after uh, um, the Caribbean and Puerto Rico were affected, we looked. We got together with our structural engineers, and we looked at what it meant to make a building that would withstand a 180 mile an hour wind. And what we found was that no conventional construction methods were capable of holding together. So now we found that we had to find a way to deliver affordable housing that would have uh, onboard, electrical onboard, potable water, the ability to cook and so forth to the Caribbean in short order. And so what we did is outfitted containers. We basically put all of the survivability issues onto the containers and the idea is that should we have another storm, the container is a refuge. But the other idea of course is that if we put these in place, you can build around them, that you can build a home and add to them and make them whole as time goes by, and they will always remain a survival element. Uh, the other great thing about them is they're so robust that they can be set underground and occupied immediately, so there's no lag time in terms of their use by the population. So these kinds of strategies have been you know, part of this uh, business, not just of keeping the lights on, but of uh, bringing the lights back on, I suppose. Uh, Many, many different types now have been uh, developed for this for this use. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is, I mean, in a way, we made our own problem, right? I mean, we have carbon dioxide concentrations over 400 parts per million. We blew past the 350 part per million threshold that was supposed to be the, you know, tremendous uh, uh, threshold for disaster. We have the highest levels of uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide in 400,000 years. 
So we have a problem. And we are here at Columbia and other uh, institutions in the private sector now, we have technologies that are evolving for uh, the filtration of carbon from the atmosphere. And there, the technology is uh, somewhat fraught at the moment. It's a high energy technology. It uses a, a lot of electricity to run uh, the, the filter and reclamation device. So we set to our students a challenge of integrating into urban settings carbon sequestration as a, uh, as a uh, 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 technology and as a way of cleansing the air. The idea being that we balance carbon absorption. And uh, this is uh, the, just, just off of the, just this last semester's work. This is a park in downtown Los Angeles. It uses a chimney and a, uh, a double uh, uh, canopy over a park to basically draw air across a carbon filter without using supplemental energy. And with uh, four or five hundred of these in place throughout the LA area, we would reach carbon neutrality. And uh, here's the interior park space uh, underneath the canopy that makes a contribution to the city. Uh, other students looked at uh, different kinds of devices, modular devices spread uh, throughout the city as towers that use uh, NASA uh, uh, vertical windmills to fuel the, uh, the carbon sequestration processes. And so I think ultimately our, resilience, uh, our resiliency efforts have to expand beyond uh, uh, simply keeping the lights on to making it possible for us to not have to weather these uh, tremendous changes in uh, weather. So uh, that's, that's my talk. Jim, I just want to say I love that concept of having survivable elements of a building. You know, that are we planning, Brian said, if you think early on about what the operational needs are, in your worst case scenario, what energy load, what functions does your building need to have? But it harks back to discussions we had earlier today about what time frame are we considering. So what you might need when you're designing an office building may be different if it changes to a research lab uh, during its lifetime. So thank you, Jim. Okay, people. It's engineering time. <laughs> My job is to make you experts in cogeneration microgrids as they relate to electrical resiliency in 15 minutes. So here we go. In October of 2012, when the world's most reliable electric grid was preemptively shut down, the lights went out, but you can see a few bright spots. So what we're going to talk about is how we can, what's being done, what can happen, what are the barriers to an end where the next time this happens, if it happens, there are a lot more bright spots. Just for context, it's not just the grid that is a vulnerability for us. Preemptively, all of the nuclear plants in New Jersey were also shut down prior to the, the storm based on concerns about their cooling water intakes. We all know about the vulnerabilities of overhead transmission. And another vulnerability that isn't discussed as much is that of substations and transformers, which are vulnerable, of course, to physical events, but especially to human-initiated events, both physical and cyber. And the real, uh, the real liability here is that that transformer you see, if it needed to be replaced, based on the current global supply chain, the way it's structured, will take one year. So a systematic outage of a number of transformers is uh, a scenario that we don't want to think about. So the imperative, obviously, um, around resiliency of electricity to modern society is growing. So one mitigation. Cut out the uh, transmission, 
the substation, mm -hmm. and the grid. Put a power plant on the roof of a building. That's what this is. This is a power plant in a box. This is what the inside of the box looks like, or the inside of a room in a building that has one of these devices. Left-hand side is the engine. It's the same technology as in your car, more or less, a little bigger. The right side is the uh, generator that converts mechanical shaft power into electricity. All early industrial revolution innovations, tried and true. The problem is it's a stranded asset in most contexts. And so the economic viability of putting in standby generators everywhere is, is limited. So what can be done? Well, that industrial revolution heat engine is pretty inefficient. So we can put some industrial process around that engine and capture the large amount of heat that is not utilized in the process of making electricity from fossil fuel. The two white boxes in the center, that's the green machine that I just showed you. So we add a little more hardware, capture all that waste heat, turn it into something useful in the form of cooling and heating effect and bring that to the same building. And that heat has value. And so now we've got the potential for a business enterprise. And that's given birth to a whole sector of our economy in the, in the form of cogeneration, also called combined heat and power, also called distributed generation. They're synonyms. So this seems like panacea, right? We've got a business, makes money. Now we've got an engine in our building and that'll power the lights and that should be it. Obviously it isn't, but the market is active towards these ends. This is a device called a micro turbine, which is a tiny little jet engine about this big, fits in a box, generates electricity and useful waste heat. This is a product category specifically targeted to small buildings, small commercial residential projects in the 30 to 60 kW range. Here's another approach, fuel cells. Um, these have been coming along with great promise. Our next speaker will explain why it's taken so long, but um, there are three of these actually in the, in the bases of each of the Trade Center Towers. Um, the real uh, advantage of this approach is there are no products of combustion. There is no combustion. So it's utilizing fossil fuel, the long carbon hydro chain, uh, extracting that energy to make electricity and useful heat. But what comes out the tailpipe is water and, and CO2. So tremendous application to dense urban environments for obvious reasons. So now let me take you through a short case study that will illustrate some of the, some of the history around the challenges and try to give you some idea of the kind of the pace that we're on um, to opening up the, the, um, the, the, the wider scale deployment of Cogen for this purpose as well as its own economic uh, viability uh, purpose. Bank of America Tower uh, was, was designed about a dozen years ago. The owner of the Durst organization, a progressive green developer, was very interested in integrating Cogen into the building um, as a market leading initiative. In this case, it would be a five megawatt Cogen system. That, that equates or scales to about a third of the peak demand of that building when it was fully occupied to give you some sense of order of magnitude. But this, the challenges are, 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 are formidable, especially in a dense urban high-priced real estate market like Midtown Manhattan. 
These are big machines. They take a lot of space. That space is expensive. They're noisy. Um, there's, there's a lot of process and operations that go along with them with staffing. Natural gas needs to be available. It wasn't. And of course, the products of combustion for a conventional kind of technology like this is a gas turbine um, basically need to go out the top of a building uh, in order to dilute those pollutants to levels that are acceptable based on current regulations. And the electrical connection of this machine to a building's electrical distribution is, is not simple and it's not easy. Basically, the electrical distribution in a large com commercial building is, is, is like a tree uh, with a trunk coming in from the street, from the regulated utility, and then branching off in every which way to serve all the loads distributed throughout the building. <clears throat> a cogen system, to be economically viable, needs to have access to all of those load centers in the building. Why is that? Because, generally speaking, the business case is strengthened by high utilization of that asset, meaning that unit runs 24-7, and the electrical loads in these buildings, especially office buildings, varies dramatically. So the challenge is at the, in, in the evening or off hours and on weekends to be able to grab all of that load that exists in the building, which is a fraction of what it is during the peak daytime load. So that by necessity then means that the connection from the generator or the cogen system to the tree happens to hap needs to happen at the trunk. And the trunk is down at the street, at the bottom. And this cogen system is often at the top, where the products of combustion you know, want to be released. So there's an obvious issue there in terms of scope and cost. Now, in our case of this project, a large 2 million square foot building, there are actually several trunks of the tree that come in from the street. There could be as many as six in a building of this scale. And so the rational diagram of being able to access all the load of six trunks of the tree meant we need to go one step up further up the food chain, and we really need to reach out and, in, and interconnect at the grid, right outside the front door. Simple electrical connection goes out the front door, grabs the grid right there, and the output of the cogeneration system is metered, and it's subtracted from the meters that measure the building's extraction from the grid. Very simple, very easy, very cost effective. So we went on our way with great enthusiasm, went down to our local uh, grid operator, Con Edison. <laughs> Guess what their reaction was? <laughs> it was a tale of woe to beat the band. And safety and reliability and danger associated with, God forbid, a customer actually generating power on their own property and having those dirty electrons interact with theirs on their grid. <laughs> a six-month process ensued of increasing escalation within senior management, engaging the political powers in New York State, and in all fairness to Con Ed, they were acting in a completely rational way because their regulatory framework rewards them, rewards their business for two things. Financing capital assets and selling electricity on a volume basis. So a customer providing generation on their property was obviously going to dilute the need for additional capital assets and reduce the sale of purchase electricity. So their behavior was entirely rational. And they're good at this, uh, at this prerogative. And the kind of story here is that it took, after six months, <clears throat> and the help of environmental advocates like NRDC, Ashok Gupta, some of you probably know, to the then Governor Pataki of New York State, over many months, finally there was an agreement, 
that they would make one exception. They'd allow this particular high profile developer on this particular site with great environmental ambitions to conduct this experiment and build this generator at this cogen plant and connect it in that way. Never to be repeated again. Now, of course, every project thereafter used this as a precedent, and it's been the standard ever since. So flash forward five years or so, Columbia University has got a new campus, a few blocks up the street, dozen, 15 buildings. The existing infrastructure is, is inadequate, it's limited. And so this thinking continued. And so the idea was, Let's interconnect a grid. Let's develop a grid that interconnects those buildings, but that's, let's connect it to the municipal grid in one spot, one interconnection. Instead of just continuing the, the continuous network up at Manhattan, having lots of kind of avenues and streets of, of distribution coming in, we, we'd isolate ourselves with one point of interconnection. That would give us the ability to implement this same strategy for cogeneration, but also be able to control our own destiny. In that there's the opportunity now, if all hell breaks loose and the grid is gone, Columbia can open a switch, isolate themselves, and operate that campus in a limited fashion. And there's some future phases that need to, to come along to make it a reality, but that's the, that, that's the vision. And that, in essence, is what a microgrid is, okay? Bank of America, in essence, was a microgrid at the scale of a building, and Manhattanville is an example of a microgrid um, more, more conventionally known. A group of buildings with a similar importance factor to a community or for a similar owner or the same owner to have some autonomy from the regulated utility infrastructure. The term of art is called islanding mode of a cogeneration system. Flash forward five years to a couple years ago, related companies is going to develop Hudson Yards. That's a half dozen buildings in the first half, six million square feet of commercial development immediately latched on the idea of a microgrid because there was not existing grid infrastructure for all the same reasons as were evident at Columbia. But they had a, a, an additional emphasis. They saw a value, a marketing value, in being able to promise their commercial tenants the ability to recover from a grid outage and enjoy business as usual within a matter of seconds. Not days, not hours, but seconds. And they had already planned a 60 megawatt cogen plant uh, for the site based on just general uh, kind of good citizenship, carbon reduction strategies, and, and a viable business enterprise. So we went back to Con Ed, said this is what we're going to do. We're going to do it all over again, and we've got this microgrid. And by, and by the way, this time we need a, a switch that we control between us and you so that, you know, if you have problems, we're going to open this switch, and we're going to be independent, and we're going to keep the lights on. What do you think their reaction was? <laughs> it was like deja vu all over again. Oh my gosh. We can't have you opening one or operating one of our switches. What if, you know, what if you're operating by yourselves and our grid is having trouble and you close the switch inadvertently and you send power into our grid and oh my God. <coughs> So another bunch of months of process, a lot of discussions, a lot of schemes, a lot of complexity, and one of my partners came up with a brilliantly simple solution is, let's just put two switches in a row between us and you. We'll control one switch, you control the other. That way you, can't, you can prevent us from ever coming back on and putting electrons in your grid, and we can take ourselves offline within seconds if you have a, have a problem. And so as simple as that, it didn't take the governor this time, and uh, when that's, that's progress. So on another kind of 
kind of vector of of forces that influence are going to influence cogen because it does feel like we are making progress in terms of its viability and its applicability as a is a mitigation strategy. There's an interesting tension now going on uh, on, a, on the policy front. The, 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 the city's 80 by 50 carbon reduction plan necessitates that the combustion of fossil fuels in buildings must reduce dramatically. You just can't make the numbers work with the, even, even if there's no additional combustion, if just the legacy combustion of fossil fuels in all the existing the city's portfolio of buildings. So on the one hand, the policy direction feels like it will ebb towards uh, disincentivizing additional combustion sources like cogen in this case, as well as other, uh, other, sor other, other uses. On the other hand, when you look at the carbon reduction plots, in 2022, if Indian Point closes, there is a huge spike in resultant carbon emissions because of where that 2,000 megawatts of power will come from. And there's strong suggestion that that'll incentivize or want to incentivize additional clean generation in the city to support some of that load and offset some of that. Otherwise, uh, carbon emissions will come from dirtier sources. So there is a tension going on right now, and that will have to, you know, we're gonna have to see how that all plays out, but I think it's something really to watch out for. And then in terms of technology evolution, the only thing that, um, or what's something you should all really follow is the whole issue of storage and the, the, the rapidly falling price of, of electrical storage, um, lithium ion being the you know, technology du jour, um, that's gonna open up tremendous uh, opportunities in, in qualifying renewable sources as a resilient, a resilient or a reliable source um, to, to augmenting the business case for renewables as well as other fossil sources by shifting peak load. So that's something we think um, that we really will you know, we'll see a lot of action on and we should pay attention to. And this is what those lithium ion uh, cells you know, look like in a building context, uh, a building scale system, a room full of racks of those, of those, small, those small cells. And, and that's it. <clears throat> so thank you, Scott. I think his case studies illustrate that we're really trying to integrate new systems and new technologies into you know, historic business models and regulatory frameworks. And one of the questions is, are we stuck trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, or are there positive changes on the way? And we're going to look to Travis to uh, show us the light. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, no pressure. No pressure. Right. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Travis Bradford. I'm uh, my, uh, my, my day job is, is that I... Uh, uh, teach here at Columbia. I teach at the policy school and the business school, and and through the Earth Institute Sustainability Management Program. And I also run run a nonprofit that does a lot of research around engaging business solutions to uh, energy and environmental issues. But I also do a lot of work with outside companies, and I'm on the board of. Um, I, I'm I recently became the executive chairman of a fuel cell company, Watt Fuel Cell. Uh, so uh, love all this talk of microgrids and CHP, go fuel cells. Um, the um, and I'll tell you, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it, but 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 not that much. I'm also on the board of an electric motorcycle company where we use a lot of those batteries that look just like that in motocross motorcycles. Because hey, if you want if you want ludicrous mode, no, nothing better than a motocross motorcycle for ludicrous mode. Um, the um, so I uh, so I do a lot of stuff, and I work with a lot of of, of you know, and as a professor, professional practice, I, I I work both inside and outside the university. Um, and I've been doing a lot of this stuff for a long time, and I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, and I titled the talk The End of the Distributed Revolution, um, which, is, uh, which is a bit of a poke at myself because uh, the, the bottom uh, lower left of the corner uh, is a book that I wrote about 15 years ago called Solar Revolution, the Economic Transformation of the Global Energy Industry. For some reason, it's in the environmental section of, the, your, of your local bookstore if you want to buy a copy. I don't know which part of economic transformation of the global energy industry qualifies it to be in the environmental section, but anyway. The, um, uh, so, uh, 
So the, 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 and, and what I talked about in that book is basically the emergence of a distributed architecture led by a number of technologies. And I, I overlooked the fact that natural gas had been doing distributed generation for a very long period of time. And, uh, and, and we'd been sort of driving the, the uh, generation capacity of our grid into smaller increments and further toward the end users, not unlike how we did with computing, moving away from um, um, uh, a sort of uh, um, a central uh, 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 station computing and, and, and into more distributed kind of PC architectures. And the, the um, you know, we had mainframes and dummy terminals, and then we went to sort of networked PCs, and now we went from centralized switching uh, in telephony to uh, now uh, more power than we put on the first rocket to the moon in each of our pockets. Um, the uh, and so so I we we map this um, uh, revolution in in sort of distributing the capacities of the systems onto the energy system, and and I talk about the end of the distributed revolution because in some sense all revolutions end, right? Some end in success and some end in defeat, right? Some end in fire and some end in ice. Um, some end when you stop by your local con ed office and ask them for permission to do something and they say no. Um, the um, uh, the uh, but 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 one way or the other, this transformation has to has to end. It either becomes subsumed into the architecture as what's new and normal, or it has to be, um, or or it has to sort of uh, become a, an, an ancillary or, or cute component technology that, that that remains at the fringe. But in the, you can't sustain a revolution forever. It either transforms the system uh, uh, fundamentally, or it doesn't. So that's sort of the talk. And I think it's interesting as well because we need to talk about the system writ large because we've had really good talks about how to make buildings more resilient and the risks that they face. And now we're going to talk about, uh, you know, the uh, and the design of future buildings and how those can be made more resilient based on the risks that they face. And we've talked about microgrids and how they can make certain campuses and, and buildings and other installations at a, in a larger, more interconnected scale uh, uh, resilient based on the risks that they face. But we need to talk about the whole electrical system, right, and the whole... Um, power delivery system and how that how the resilience of that is looking because I think what we're going to find is that the more we do some of these other things particularly the more we do of microgrids not everybody gets to participate in that and there's a, still a grid left that has to serve a lot of folks and as we make some parts of it more resilient we may find that we're making other parts of it less resilient and we need and then so we need to sort of recognize that um, and, and come to our own conclusions about how to manage that. So to think about that, I think about the three basic goals of electricity provision, not the three basic goals of a, of a utility, right? The, 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 I think the goals of the utility were fairly well articulated. Put more assets in service um, and, uh, and uh, uh, try to keep the grid from failing. So those are not quite the same things. But if you're a grid regulator, um, you have basically twin, originally twin, now three sort of goals that you're trying to accomplish. You're trying to make sure that people uh, pay the least amount that they have to pay in order to get the maximum amount of service and resilience, uh, including in many jurisdictions the, the sort of goal of universal service uh, so that everybody can have access to modern forms of electricity. And, and now increasingly they, we have to be somewhat cognizant that that's done in an equitable way and without in gross environmental damages, right? So we, wanna, we want high reliability, low cost, and it, we, no, no negative sort of consequences either socially or environmentally. So notwithstanding the fact that those are in, inherently inconsistent goals, right? We, we want high reliability, but we want it to be cheap, right? The, um, I had a contractor that convinced, tried to convince me that they could do both once. It didn't work out that way. Um, the, um, so, so we have to um, sort of begin to think about how is the system changing and how, is it, how are we gaining capacities or opportunities to enhance the, the delivery of these goals and where are those goals at risk of being um, uh, sort of we failed to deliver them. And, and, and really this conference and this conversation is about the middle of those, right? You want to try to make sure we have higher reliability both in short term storm and uh, resilience uh, ways, but also in the long term uh, we want to make sure that the grid itself um, delivers, and if it gets too expensive, and then we 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 or we don't invest uh, correctly, or we have stranded assets that we've put in that are of no value to people, uh, whether we can or, or can't monetize those, then it's not a then then it's going to be very expensive, and it's not really going to be all that much more resilient. So it gets very tricky um, as we move forward. So so what what the what what's beginning to happen? And I'll do this through the case study of sort of solar generation now. Um, uh, Times Square is not the best place to do sort of uh, solar-driven buildings. 
Uh, but the vast majority of America still has enough sun falling on it where they can meet some portion of their uh, needs. Some places more than others. Clearly, Mobile, Alabama is not one of those places. I didn't know either. That's good to know. I uh, will not start a solar business in Mobile, Alabama. Um, the, um, but, the, the, um, but there are a lot of places, and you can do this at the utility scale, and you can do this at the grid scale. And we have mechanisms that have been driving in, in, the, in the attempt to create the goal of, of, of better um, uh, energy with better environmental characteristics. Um, we can do it at the utility scale through RPS programs and the, uh, and, and the uh, regulators that love them. But a lot of the, the goal has been to try to drive um, this distributed architecture that we've talked about. And, I, and, and, and what happened is, and I point out sort of that I wrote Solar Revolution when the, uh, when the price was still up around nine to nine or 10 bucks a watt for an installed system, not to tell you that I'm very smart, but to tell you that, that if, 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 if I could have figured this out, that this was gonna be a tra trajectory, it should, be, it should have been fairly obvious to a lot of folks who weren't otherwise um, uh, had their blinders on. But the, um, the, but the idea that, that, that we're engaged in a set of new technologies that are actually better for the environment and, and driving down costs and can be done at a distributed um, scale. Um, and this trajectory is beginning to have, you know, in the first few years, it's nice and it's cute and the utilities will come along and they'll say, fine, you can connect your stuff to my grid and we'll, we'll, let you, we'll give you a net metering because, you know, net, net, you're not going to do that much. Um, but then all of a sudden it starts to get real. And when it starts to get real, uh, is when the ducks show up. And uh, the, um, so apparently that looks like a duck, that curve. Uh, the one on the left definitely looks like a duck. Um, but the, the, the one on the right apparently also looks like a duck, so it's called the duck curve. Uh, and the duck curve basically shows that as you have higher and higher levels of penetration uh, in, a, in, a, in a grid system, the, um, the, the amount of electricity that you generate, particularly at the sunniest, peakiest parts of the day from those systems obviously goes up by definition, and therefore the net amount that you have to get from the grid drops off. Now, what was previously, um, can you see my thing? What was previously a nice flat um, uh, load curve that the utility had to meet, small fluctuations, a little bit change in weather and, and uh, day of the week, and you could sort of manage that stuff. Now all of a sudden, they've got to ramp down, and then at, tor towards the end of the day, when everybody's coming home and flipping on, or they're plugging in their Teslas and they're flipping on their margarita blenders or whatever it is they do, um, the, um, the 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 ramp on the lo on the system becomes very dramatic. This is, and so this, from a utilities point of view, is a very, as was said, rational response to say, whoa, 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 this is a problem. We have a, we, this is going to make our grid less resilient. And oh, by the way, we're getting lower capacity utilization in our generation base or, 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 or and, and we're having to, and we're being able to charge less per kilowatt hour, or, 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 or sorry, we're selling less kilowatt hours to the customers and therefore the price we have to charge to customers for each kilowatt hour in order to recover our costs, which we are legally allowed to do, has to go up to compensate. And so what you end up with is a death spiral. And the more the cost of, the, of just the delivery of the grid Notwithstanding the cost of the generation of the grid, which is probably also it's traditionally the the the, uh, the generation of the electricity itself on a wholesale power basis is is tends to be somewhat volatile. It tends to you know um, have its own set, set of issues. But even just the cost of the grid itself, which is still in, needs to serve everybody quite reliably, um, and it is now going up on a per unit basis. It's one of the reasons California has one of the highest electricity rates in the country. It's not because uh, uh, necessarily of the reasons that you think. It's largely because the average household in California uses about half the uh, uh, kilowatt hours per household as any other uh, place in the United States or the rest of the United States on average. So the cost of their electricity has to go up as a result. Well, as the cost of the electricity goes up, more and more people want to switch to the distributed generation options. But as more and more people switch to the distributed generation options, the more the cost goes up for the, for the remainder of the grid. So so the, the, the regulators which thought, hey, this is cute, we'll, we'll throw a bone to the environmentalists, are now realizing that their net metering and their, uh, uh, and their uh, uh, interconnection for these distributed systems and having that one connection point um, onto something that's a microgrid that could easily meet all of its own needs is suddenly very, very expensive and it creates a big risk for the, their, their continued operation. And utilities are very good at forecasting 30 and 40 years out. They, 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 they're the best at it because they, they can think in these long investment cycles. And so the, um, and so 
So they're the ones that are first sort of coming out with this. There was a great paper back in 2013 put out by the Edison Electric Institute called Disruptive Challenges. And they had some great quote in there about if we don't get ahead of this, um, this could really end up undermining the, 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 the safety of the entire US grid. And it was a bit of a manifesto um, if, uh, if incumbent producers uh, uh, like that have manifest, usually the revolutionaries have their manifestos. But in this case, the, but it, was, it was basically a call to action for all the electric utilities to go to their regulators and say, we've got to stop this because our grid is getting less resilient and, uh, and riskier, and it's definitely going to get more expensive. We have to slow this down. So what are they going to do? How do they, how do they slow this down? Um, well, they have a bunch of tools, right? They have economic tools. They can change the economics. They can try to, um, uh, they can try to reduce the, uh, or they can increase the demand charges or the fixed charges associated with the installations. Uh, and reduce the volumetric charges. That changes the economics of doing distributed generation. They can, you know, charge you a lot of money just to have that that switch at the uh, uh, um, at the junction. The um, they can go to to um, regulatory solutions. They can try to prohibit it from a regulatory point of view, or certainly make it harder for you to adopt. Uh, and um, uh, and then of course they can support things like tariffs and other things that 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 undermine the. Uh, the economics or the viability or the market development of these of these distributed solutions uh, and and ultimately if that doesn't work if you can't beat them join them there is the possibility that in many utilities in New Jersey and other places have looked to rate base these as, as well if we can't if we can't um, if we should be at least be able to as the as the um, uh, uh, legally endowed uh, provider of electricity a monopoly provider of electricity we should be allowed to put this to put this onto people's homes and in customers uh, basements in the case of, of uh, cogen plants and things and then we should be able to rate base it that's allowed in some places it's not in others it gets a, a really sticky question and it really brings up some very fundamental questions about the grid system itself which is if there are alternative ways to deliver electricity to customers um, is the gr electric grid still a natural monopoly or is it just a monopoly Right? It, it, we, we begin to ask very fundamental questions about, is this the right architecture? But we can't imagine getting rid of it either. I mean, look, imagine that now everybody wants to leave the grid, grid defection. It's not totally you know, sort of feasible yet, although there's plenty of great examples at the commercial and industrial scale where people are saying, we're going to keep that grid connection for convenience, but we don't have to have it. If we added a little more storage and a, few more, and a little more generation capacity, a little better load management, We'd be just fine without the grid. So, so should that be allowed? And if so, who pays for the grid? Right? Who pays for the rest of the people that are left on the grid? And that's, these are really existential questions. And we cannot solve the, the resilience of our electricity system until we resolve these questions. And this is something we'll be working on for the next 20 or 30 years. Um, there are, and there are ways to, to exacerbate this. And this is, I don't want to talk too much about fuel cells, um, but there are lots of ways that you can add you can add generation capacity and resilience and storage and buffering and all the other things that you need to meet the low cost, high reliability, low environmental impact goals without having to have an electrical connection. And these are just going to continue to get better, right? And I, particularly, I'm executive chairman of a fuel cell company. I'm a particular fan of that technology. Lower emissions, much higher efficiencies, no noise. Uh, the uh, you great heat that can come out of it and, and be used for applications. We don't need combustion. It's not economically or environmentally defensible in, in the near term future. Um, we, we happen to get there just so I can to toot our own horn. We happen to get there because we can we figured out how to 3D print fuel cells. So it's a great innovation. It dramatically reduces the cost and improves their performance. If it's our innovation or if it's somebody else's innovation, innovation is coming just like innovation in storage. Um, which is also driving down the cost curve, as was mentioned. Innovation in fuel cells will drive down the cost curve. Innovation in building management systems. There's an exploding set of tools that will enable people to meet those, tr the, those three goals of low cost, high reliability, and low environmental and social impact electricity delivery. And, and many of them won't need the electric grid to do that. We'll have real competition for electricity provision. But we still have to figure out what to do with the, with, with the rest of the system. So my belief is creative destruction is inevitable. Um, the, um, there's going to be increased economic com competition for completed packages of distributed solutions. But we're going to have to answer all these questions. How quickly are they going to be available? Who's going to deliver them? Who's going to be allowed to deliver them? Who's going to be prohibited from delivering them? Um, uh, how do we manage the cost shifting issues and stranded assets? 
um, the, uh, and, and how is policy and regulatory um, uh, uh, processes going to help or hinder the, this? And, uh, and ultimately, what's the right configuration? Because if we know where we're going, it'd be a whole lot easier to point us in the right direction to get there. But we don't really have that vision yet. So I, I, I think that, that, that as we're dealing with buildings and as we're dealing with microgrids and, and, and smaller units, I think we really have to make sure that we uh, have a resilient uh, overall energy architecture if we want to solve the, the, the problem completely. Anyway, thank you. I look forward to the questions. So as I think that really illustrated, um, when you're thinking about energy resiliency in buildings, you know, you're starting from the design, the construction, the operational piece, but each of those early decisions you need to think about what's the world you're operating in today and what world maybe we operating in in the future. Sorry, there's a lot open here. Um, so one question I just want to ask you all before I open it for questions more broadly. Um, so as we're talking about all these new technologies that are out there, there's new systems, they all have the capacity to provide a lot. Um, how much when you're, you know, kind of pitching these or being asked to include these devices, you know, are you promising that something can deliver? So if you look at the example of net zero buildings, you know, net zero buildings to succeed depend on their construction and design, but then how the tenant operates them. And certification of their success usually doesn't come for at least one or two years until after the building's been occupied. So, you know, the idea of reps and warranties and indemnifications is not new. But are you seeing any shift in how you write these contracts or how you're shifting liability between yourselves and clients or with subcontractors as there are new technologies that can potentially promise more or deliver more but are dependent both on kind of your roles in the project and then how people operate their facilities? Um, so to start with that easy question. Um. I'll, I'll <laughs> start by adding we're just getting into the ripe season for the performance from the lead 2009 projects with the five-year tail on them. Mm -hmm. How are they performing? How do they, or are they supposed to be performed? And then if they're not, who, whose fault is it, yeah. right? Thank you. Most people don't like to hear me. Um, I was just saying that we're in the ripe season of uh, the lead 2009 projects being past the five-year tail on performance. And the projects that aren't performing as they're designed, there's some uh, negative uh, things that happen to them, including losing their certification status. But that's a ripe season for litigation uh, for any lawyers who are looking for work. Um, <laughs> but it raises the question, your question is very valid. I don't know the exact answer other than everyone will run to their corner <laughs> And find the best one of y'all we can and uh and try to fight it instead of really address what we need to be addressing which is why is it not working how do we fix it how do we make it more resilient um so i i just want to offer i think that is um i'd like to see as a, as a contractor i'd like to see more of a holistic thought process focused on the, the solution and not having uh, penalties for it not accomplishing the original goal, I guess. So there's an experiment that's about to happen in New York City with this issue. Um, by all indications, uh, a bill will be introduced to mandate absolute energy performance of existing buildings. And that's a complete paradigm shift. It's, it's, it's akin to, you know, a metric like net zero. It's quantifiable. There's, there's, there's no kind of hypothetical benchmarks involved. It's just at the end of the day, at the end of the year, how much energy. And what the stakeholders have already started to anticipate is that, you know, the performance of a building over the course of a year that's occupied by tenants who may or be, may be known or not known at the time it was designed that is operated by an entity who may or may not be skilled. It's constructed by a builder who may or may not be proficient and designed by a team that may or may not be um, negligent or not. And so what's clear is <laughs> there's gonna be plenty of work for all of you for some period of time until the standards of care can be created. 
because right now there are none. There's no standard of care that we're aware of that regulates my behavior as a design professional um, you know, to show that, that I exercised you know, the, the, the kind of the conventional prudent practice around predicting energy performance in the design environment, like there isn't a standard of care for how Brian builds it, nor is there a standard of care really that's defining how property managers and operators are gonna operate a building. And all three of those have significant dependency on the actual performance outcome of buildings. So we're about to enter a whole new whole new world. New York City may be a little bit ahead, but this is coming this is coming nationwide. Answer that real quick. So, my um, my general view is is that there's there, there there's certainly the regulatory aspect that has to be met and 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 uh, and standards have to be upheld. I I think there's a second gatekeeper who decides whether these buildings get built or, or, or and 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 the and the characteristics and the performance of these buildings over a long period of time, particularly when you start adding in. Um, uh, sort of secondary technologies like solar and storage, and 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 even and and you're retrofitting um, CHP into the buildings. A lot of these things are separately financed, and the person that really gates whether these assets will be installed and performed and what they will cost will be the project lenders and or project finance, where, um, the debt and equity that that support it. The the debt tends to care um, a whole lot about these things because when when performance fails just a little bit in these assets over a long period of time. The, uh, they're the ones that are usually the most exposed uh, in terms of their underlying uh, financial economics. But the um, but so you really, if you want to think about, and, and a lot of work has been done sort of trying to get investors to think about green bonds and other things, which I think is helpful, but I don't think it's really yet moving the needle in terms of driving capital, and, and especially if it doesn't have a... a uh, sort of a preemptive price on it that that, that or preferential price that, that people are willing to uh, take a lower return in order to get these uh, better characteristics. But that's that's a possibility. But generally, if you want to make sure that these things are going to work and you think that and they're going to be available, um, the project finance uh, uh, backers are the ones that are going to be um, one of the people that are going to be very close to looking and making sure that those characteristics exist. Well, you know, I think the question is: Are these uh, are are these uh, approaches going to yield the results that we need in the long run? I mean, I think there's a bit of a, there were really babies of this. I mean, we've been talking about operational energy, but we've not talked about the energy it takes to create the buildings and the infrastructure in the first place. And we have a very difficult time measuring that. And it's extraordinarily more energy consumptive than the, uh, the bit that we use to fuel the buildings. We have some funny dynamic going on right now. The city of Los Angeles, despite a tremendously progressive uh, energy policy, has over the last two years seen increases in carbon and uh, pollutants in their atmosphere. So we are not, through the means that we have available to us at this moment, controlling the situation. So, you know, it's very difficult. I mean, Brian, Brian talked about uh, the qualifications of the personnel uh, going at this. I mean, they're. The qualifications across the board, whether it's architectural, whether it's the builders, are woefully inadequate. I mean, we the best system we found for uh, measuring embodied energy is coming from Fort Thomas Study at the moment, and it's tremendously difficult to use. Um, I mean, I understand that the battery in a uh, in a Tesla car has the equivalent embodied energy of about uh, 100,000 miles of conventional driving. So, you know, you, there, this, is, this is a funny business we're talking about. And we, like I say, I think we're very in this. I'd like to open it up for questions. Yep. Thanks. Um, so I have to give full disclosure that my organization, the um, Peace Energy and Climate Center, intervened in Climate Distance last week. Um, and uh, we uh, gave testimony of the importance of incentivizing high efficiency, low emission CHP um, through reforming standby rates. So uh, my question is going to be a little bit of a leading question, but um, two, two parts. Number one, so we kind of know where the situation is in New York, but if, do the same conditions exist in other cities where uh, the incumbent distribution utility uh, pushes back against on-site generation? And number two, um, to what extent do you feel that um, something as um, wonky as rate design can impact project financeability? 
<laughs> Why is everybody looking at me? That's for you. Um, so uh, yeah, so so look, there there there's a there's a spectrum of there's a spectrum of electric utilities that that are and and their responses they somewhat map to the characteristics of how much generation do they own? Are they are they unbundled or not? Uh, and then are they in jurisdictions where they've really begun to see? The, they, 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 they understand how deeply distributed generation will cut into their economics. And, and, and outside the United States, you'll see in Europe, a lot of the utilities really have gotten the message and they're starting to think of new business models. Um, and we've worked with PSEG and others at roundtables here to try to think of new business models, the utility as a distribution platform. Uh, we did a lot of the work that, that I think ultimately informed the REV process, which is an experimental way, uh, the reforming the energy vision in New York to try to do this. Um, so, um, and you will get occasionally you'll get you'll get smaller municipal utilities in very progressive jurisdictions, and I'm thinking sort of Sacramento Municipal Utility District or San Diego and other places. Um, we worked with uh, Lakeland Electric in Florida on a on a solar hot water project. So you'll get really progressive um, uh, utilities that that have less of a regulatory burden because they're munis and they don't have to report back quite as stringently as the investor owned utilities are. So that's that's a great way place to start. What's interesting, though, is you have to remember there's another grid that's actually benefiting from this. And we've begun spending time thinking about if you've got a death spiral on the electric grid, you have the opposite effect on the natural gas grid. If I can double the amount of natural gas I can sell into a property because I'm now generating electricity off of it, now I can amortize my gas grid costs more effectively across the rest of the generation base. So now it's not... You know, it's not just a one, the customer is better off, but the utility and the remaining utility customers are worse off. It's actually one utility is better off and one utility is worse off. That sounds like competition, right? So now how do you get there? Well, in with, with our, we, we have a partner at our at, at Watt, um, that it, which, which is People's Gas of Pittsburgh. Now you might imagine a natural gas utility in Pittsburgh sitting on top of the Marcellus Shale, a lot of stranded gas trying to figure out ways to use it, very excited about the opportunity of using that cheap gas for economic development and lowering bills for customers. Um, and so there's, a, so there's a great play there. Um, and that's not ubiquitous, but just like the, the cost curves of solar and storage and fuel cells and everything else, you're going to see more and more markets where, uh, where it opens up. And I think you know, many utilities are in a race to be second. So if you start seeing um, you know, some leading uh, uh, utilities that are trying these new business models and they're working, I think you'll see a fairly, you could see a fairly rapid shift um, by the by, the people as they as as the economics work in their favor. And I would just add to the first part of your question. You know, even before the business case, sometimes for utilities, there's a question of the legal framework. So, do the laws in that state allow a private company or even a municipality at times to own a microgrid, or does it? Do you have to fall within one of the pre-approved categories? And then the interconnection point. So, there's two objections, like paths of objections, at least that can be raised. And the simple answer to the, sorry, the second part of your question, which I forgot, which is, does wonky rate design influence um, capital formation? Yes. I mean, it, it, in fact, it's definitional. It goes into the financial models, and, the, and there are a lot of underwriting will be done around all of the scenarios in which the, the, the use cases and the, and the resulting revenues or costs of the generator, um, the, 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 it is, it's understood to three decimal places because that's the way the economics ultimately are defined. Does anyone else want to jump in before we move to another question? Okay, so you went up in the back. Um, and just on that point about wonky rate design, uh, here in New York, I don't know how many people in the weeds on this, but the value of distributed energy resources that's being rolled out for your to replace net metering, um, while I think the intent behind it is sound and variable, so it's basically instead of just saying a, an exported kilowatt hour of solar electricity to the grid, is worth exactly as much as um, a kilowatt hour consumed from the grid. We're now moving to something where it, the value of that kilowatt hour is dependent on where it's being produced, what time it's being produced, the type of building, uh, the meter is behind, et cetera. So basically, those are reasonable ideas, but we're moving from a not wonky tariff to an, the wonkiest anybody's ever come up with. Um, I don't think that's actually a federation also. And so, Renewable Careful, Energy, some of us were involved in that. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the solar industry and the storage industry don't, I mean, first of all, this doesn't even address storage yet. Um, but 
it's just getting more difficult here. Um, it's one thing if you're ending up with a lower rate, which is happening with robotic storage under here, uh, sorry, solar. But I think the bigger issue is that it's just introduced extra uncertainty because first of all, the calculator is incomprehensible and it varies over time. Uh, so securing financing is actually getting harder instead of easier. Um, so I think the question is, yeah, are, as we get more complicated, are we creating wrenches while we're actually trying to you know, solve one problem? Are we making other pieces harder? Um, I don't know if any of you have thoughts you <clears> want to share. Yeah, no, I will. Oh, sorry, I'll just agree with your point. The the sometimes sometimes more more um, uh, more complexity actually has more costs more in the risk that you're generating. And I, the way I say it, and when I, in, when, I, when I teach is the um, is just the introduction of the possibility of new policy increases risk, and therefore the the required rates of return for people to move forward in capital deployment. Um, and I think people should understand that some sim, simple. So we used to call it rough justice. Like we did the calculations on the value of solar and all the different uh, variables that you would think. And it is an elegant, wonderful, wonky um, um, uh, uh, thing to an analyze. But in the end, the numbers didn't turn out much differently in, in the first 5 to 10% penetration uh, at that, of net metering. So we said, so we called it rough justice. You just keep net metering in place. It was really simple. It, you didn't have to change any of the policy, and people were better off. But, you know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I guess when you're a policy person, you want to make a new policy. And, and frankly, I think I commend people for working on it. But it, it does have the potential for the effect that you just described very uh, well. So I think we have time for one more short question. It's going to go to you right there. Yeah. <laughs> I have been selected. Um, yeah, so I was wondering if you No, I think you're right. And usually what's happening is there is there is IRPs are going back to the regulators and the regulators are saying, uh, no, try again because you didn't include certain options that w should be available or, or are available today. That, but and, and, and look, to, to be fair, utilities need to be told what they're allowed to put in and not put in and what they can rely on in terms of their economic for and, and system um, volume and risk forecasting. But I guess I would like to hear because there's a bunch of folks who work every day on with work work with um, coopetition with the utilities. Um, and what programs are you seeing that the utilities are willing to buy into in terms of putting these innovations in? Where where, where are they most motivated to uh, to participate? Or or none of the above. Well, I mean, something I've, I've observed, the so Southern Company. Can you use the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. I did it again. I, I'm observing, you know, working in the southeastern part of the United States, Southern Company oftentimes is uh, collaborating with the DOD, uh, putting in large arrays, solar arrays. But there's usually some type, it, it's, we'll do this, but what's coming back to us? So... <laughs> What's interesting right now is we're seeing large um, areas of solar arrays being put on military bases. A lot of the power is being brought back to the grid, the master grid, right? And um, I don't know that there's a set off for the investment on the government side, per se, yeah. that there should be. Um, so I, but other than that, I, I've heard of some, I mentioned the EMP hmm. earlier. We're seeing some uh, EMP hardening happening even in Alabama. <laughs> and, um, but uh, I don't know that it's as widespread as maybe what it should be. I would just add that in New York State, it's, um, it, it feels less transparent because of a particular artifact of the fact that the revenue, the ratepayer revenue that's slated for these kinds of programs, the systems benefits charge, flows through a quasi-independent agency called NYSERDA, and so from the perspective of a customer or a practitioner like myself, 
it's just a continuously changing kind of landscape of, of you know, the one, one year the, the regulated utilities are, are active in programs and convey a certain perspective or attitude, and then the next year they're gone, and NYSERDA's kind of come forth with a whole other set of, of, of programs. So it's very hard to kind of discern, like, what a kind of organizational cultural prerogative is just because of that, you know, that structure we have here. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny that, that the overwhelming concern on most projects is first cost. It's just the way it is. And, and there's such a tremendous impediment in terms of even considering these things, both on all fronts, whether it's uh, engineering, planning, the you know, putting the time into figuring out what NYSERDA nice is going to be offering at any given moment. Uh, the thing that's actually active and, and working is uh, basic conservation uh, measures to the contemporary energy code. I mean, it's, it's very limited in reality. Yeah. On that uplifting note, um, <laughs> we will be stopping now for a coffee break. I think these guys will be up here for a couple minutes if you want to come down with more questions. Thank you all. Thanks.